Well, hi guys, thanks for having me. Um, I'd just like to give you a, a feel today for what kind of work we do in research and development. Um, try and let you understand some of the challenges that we face and give a better understanding of where we want to take the project. Um, traditional broadcast media has been fairly specific and with the growth of the internet over the past you know, 20 odd years, uh, that has obviously changed and the demand for IT services has grown and grown and can only keep continuing. So I'd just step forward a little bit and give you a little bit of introduction about myself. I'm from Manchester in the UK, I'm a sysadmin on, in research and platforms for research and development by day and a project lead for the internal cloud build at night. Um, I was first involved with virtualization working with the Sahana Foundation in 2008. Uh, Sahana Foundation is a disaster management software that basically when there's been a, a disaster, they use it to coordinate resource and, and get the best kind of uh, allocation for resource around the, the disaster. Uh, we had our first production release running on KVM during the 2010 Haiti earthquake, so it made me realize that this stuff is ready for prime time. You know, p people's lives were in, in the hands of virtualization, and it was really important and to, to see it working. So I'll go on to about, a little bit about BBC Research and Development. Um, I take it most of you have heard of the BBC before. Um, research and development is a, is a section within, within Future Media, within the uh, within BBC. It was established in 1922, uh, shortly short after the main organisation. Um, it was two, two divisions initially, research department and the development department. Um, it grew very rapidly over the, the, the coming years and eventually ended up at a very nice place in, called Kingswood Warren in Surrey. Um, the night night three was amalgamated into the full research and development department and now we pop, uh, occupy three sites in Centre House, Media City and one Euston Square. So obviously as you can see, very nice palatial sound surroundings in Kingswood Warren to the not so palatial surroundings <laughs> of Centre House, Media City and one Euston Square in London where my uh, good colleague Matthew works. So previous technologies that we developed, we've been around for quite some time now so in a traditional Blue Peter fashion, here's one we developed earlier. Um, noise cancelling, microphones, conversion from 405 to 65 line TV, colour TV, transatlantic, the BBC Micro, um, Nikam Stereo, uh, Dab Digital and UView, which is a video on demand service that we've just been rolling out recently. So as well as that, we do quite a lot of collaboration as well with other, other organisations and one I'd like to highlight was something that myself and Matthew were involved with last year and that was um, the work with NHK, the Japanese broadcaster, on super high vision for the Olympic Games. Now that's um, an 8K, so you may have heard of ultra high definition 4K. This was 8K with 33.3 .3 megapixel and 22.2 .2 surround sound audio. That was broadcast from, well, recorded uh, at the Olympic Park and then put onto the internet, onto academics networks, and broadcast up to Bradford, to uh, Gl uh, Glasgow, and across to the States, to uh, Washington, and over to Japan. So it just goes to show you that you know, w when we come to do some collaboration, you know, we really do some good collaboration. Um, we've got a few different areas of research that we, that we concentrate on. Um, I won't go through these, but they basically are cr cover a wide different sele selections. So it could be the production content, it could be understanding user ex experience and accessibility. It could be the delivery mechanisms of how we actually get the, the TV, the content to the user itself, and several other things as well. So we basically have to, we don't have one specific use case. We have multiple different use cases for these. So every day is different. Um, we don't have one specific kind of workload that we have on the, on the shared platform. So we've, in engineering this solution, we've tried to make it as flexible, um, but also keep it as performant as possible. Um, we realise that most users don't really care about the back-end technology. They just want a service that works, that's simple and efficient. So, so some of the current projects that we've been working on. Um, IP Studio, for example, is an end-to-end -end IP uh, production tool chain. So no tapes involved in it. Um, so the, uh, you know, that's obviously very IP intensive, it's very uh, computer intensive. So a lot of the build process and, and other things around there we've been developing over the past few years and it's hopefully really helped us out on that front. Uh, a few other ones, th things like uh, object-based audio, enhanced subtitling, and world service uh, archive voice analysis and scrubbing. There are some projects that I've personally been involved in, but there's many other ones that we've, that we've got. Now, as we've been running for quite some time, and the engineers have got a lot of flexibility to do their own thing, that can sometimes bring challenges. Um, so. A certain project team, for example, may have a certain way of working and another project team may have a different way of working. Now, that allows them to be flexible in, the, in their own particular approach 
um, without having any constraints over what they want to do. But it, it creates a problem in terms of uh, you generating silos of knowledge where there's no cross-sharing cross, cross, uh, cross sharing of knowledge. Um, there's no best practices or anything like that. Some of the time taken to provision was, was long um, because project teams would be ordering their own kit, waiting for it to be delivered, having to wait for it to be installed, um, configuring it themselves. Different people would do it different ways, and it was much more difficult to, to ha handle the asset utilization. Some servers may be completely under, underpowered and uh, underused, whereas other ones may be over, overly, overly burdened. Um, so, as I, I sort of mentioned before, the demand for compute resources and storage is only going to increase over time. It's not a problem that's not going to go away. So, we had legacy systems. Um, we had very good, robust internal systems, but the, the project teams maybe not so. We had virtualization in use, but it wasn't really a consistent uh, platform. It was more running virtual, virtual machines on servers, on people's desktop machines, within our department. Obviously, my, my uh, colleague Matt had uh, a much better setup with his, his public-facing system, but we've tried to look at different areas where we can share the knowledge and try and bring the platform in under one kind of ownership. Um, Every team had the favorite distribution. One team may be running SUSE, another one CentOS, another one Fedora, uh, Ubuntu, Debian. All of them, you name it, there's probably been def several different um, combinations. And it makes it very difficult to, to deploy because there wasn't really a lot of configuration management. So if you, one project team was working on a specific library, to be able to then take that library and that code and reuse it somewhere else was quite difficult. So we thought about this for some time. We came up with a different approach. And it's pretty much sysadmin 101, to be perfectly frank. Um, we tried to reduce the time, time drains in terms of provisioning. Uh, that was obviously rather than someone going in with a CD and installing something, it's you know, pixie booting systems, just trying to bring down the, the, the time to provision quite, some, quite significantly. Uh, we want to automate everything eventually because it takes some time. Um, we're, we're getting there now. We're, we're making really good inroads into it. Um, obviously trying to standardize platforms as well. Now, that's not to say you must use this particular kind of software, you must use a solution, but to try and say, we really recommend you to use this solution, we really recommend you to use this particular product, and, and provide them the, the, the means and the facility to do that. We also wanted to take ownership of assets as well, so we could better manage the, the, the utilization of them to ensure that we're getting the most effective use out of the, the money that we're putting into the different project teams. And, and the final point, we want to make it easy to extend and re reproduce the platform um, across different other areas of the, the organization. So a little bit of caveat, we're in early stages at the moment um, within the project. It's only been running for about six months. Uh, our platform's been live for about two months, our internal one. We have two clusters online, uh, one based up in Manchester, another one based down in London. Um, the one in Manchester's been running for probably two months now, the other one coming online shortly, uh, well, very shortly. <laughs> um, we've already had teams that are interested in, in, in what we've been up to and want to you know, obviously put some money into it and hopefully extend the platform. And this has given us an ideal opportunity to develop some more best practice and share our, our, our ideas and uh, develop better interactions with other areas of the organization. So we have this platform running now, the internal one, and it's already getting some good use. So we've, I've started to move some of our internal systems infrastructure to it. Um, only piecemeal so far, not anything really, really um, important, but hopefully over, over the period of time, once we've proven that it's, it's been working as a good solution, then we can start to migrate some of those other things over. So we've been using them as build slaves for Jenkins for various different environments. We've been using it for indexing. Uh, one of the users had a 100 gig VM he asked for the other day, which worked great. Mi live migrated as well, which was interesting. Um, we've been using it for general hosting, for general web hosting and other things, but mainly just for hacking on ideas. So uh, a user wants to, as, as an idea at lunchtime or around a the, you know, water cooler effect kind of thing, and wants to go and develop that idea. They've now got a platform where they can go to instantly and just self-service, get, get a virtual machine or a number of virtual machines and play with it and test out their idea. So it kind of brings us to why did we build the cloud? Well, we've got ownership over the cloud. Um, so in, in terms of rather than building our own cloud, rather than going to an external organization, well, we have ownership and we can be more confident in the security policy because we have complete ownership over it. But there's also other reasons why as well. Um, so we can be guaranteed of the execution venue, as, as, uh, i.e. the place where the virtual machines reside, so that legal stipulations around content and other things can be met to make sure that we don't end up in China or wherever, wherever else with our data. And also network access is much faster because we're obviously on a local area network rather than trying to push it over our one. 
um, therefore latency is a lot better. So, so if you're trying to move around high definition, ultra high definition video files, then you really need to have that, that kind of degree of, uh, of performance within the system. So I'll give you a high level component view of the platform We're using Open Nebula, of course, 4.2. Um, we're running on KVM. Uh, we're using Ceph, RBD for virtual machines. Um, I'm actually using this snapshot layering drive that I'll go over a little bit later on and a custom version of Libvirt. Mainly, it's not exactly custom in terms of it, additional functionality, it's just to force Ceph authentication on. Um, we're using Ubuntu 13.04, but as this, uh, the, 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 the products seem to precipitate out a little bit more, we may go back to the long-term support version if it if it's works as well as the LTS, as the 13.04. Obviously, we don't want to be keeping everything up to date all the time in terms of rolling distros. Um, the hardware. We break into two distinct types of nodes. Um, really, we just want to keep it simple. We didn't want several different kinds of storage nodes and several different kinds of hypervisor. We just wanted one platform, so one um, compute node and one storage node that we could then horizontally scale fairly easily um, and keep them uh, quite well, you know, easy to understand for other people if they wanted to order some extra kit. They don't have to, um, they can order some compute nodes or just order some storage nodes. Um, and it's fairly off the shelf hardware, some Dell 720s with 128 gigs of RAM. The storage nodes are 320s, uh, 24 gigs of RAM. LSI SAS 2308 HBAs and just some cheap super, super micro JBOD chassis. Now that's quite um, good value for money, we think, um, in terms of what we've got out of it so far. The network itself, um, all hosts have 10 gigabit internet con connectivity. Um, we do this with Intel cards that support single I/O virtualization I found yesterday. Um, we use Copper Twinax to connect it all together. Um, we're fairly lucky because we have a Cisco Nexus that handles a lot of the other um, infrastructure, um, the central core infrastructure. But we get a very cheap way to get 10 gig ports by using the fabric extender as a top of the, route, top of the rack switch. Um, it's quite reasonable for Cisco stuff. <laughs> so a bit more about our open nebula setup. We've um, obviously been running 4.2. We've transitioned from 3.8 to 4 to 4.2. The transition from 4 to 4.2 was really, really straightforward. Um, so props to the team for the development there. Um, main user interaction is in Sunstone, the, the mainly because that's the only f f facility that they're aware of at the moment. I've not really driven them to look at the um, other uh, APIs that are available or any other sort of um, tools. But I guess that will come within time once they're aware of what it can do in the other back-end facilities. The user, our users are authenticated LDAP, and the default view for them when they log in is the new cloud view, which gives, to me, I think, a very nice way for them just to say, I want this particular VM, I want this particular storage, Pff, create me a, a machine. Um, and it works really well so far. We're using Ceph RBD for VM storage, and strangely, we're using CephFS, uh, running in Fuse <laughs> as a, the system data store. Now, you may think that we're crazy, we probably are, <laughs> but um, it's, it's, it's working really well. Uh, if you think about the number of, within our environment at least, the number of uh, actual writes, then the, the, the throughput on the Ceph system data store, it's fairly minimal, you know, it's XML objects and some other bits and bobs, maybe some system state data. And we found out that, that we can now, rather than running NFS and trying to manage other, other um, layers of complexity, we have a shared storage backend, so let's use the shared storage backend. And so far, it just all works. We're using an open V switch, um, which again, very nice piece of software. Uh, no, no qualms with that whatsoever. And we hopefully may be looking at um, connecting some of the other, other clusters together at some point in the future to see if we can do some more localized layer two bridging kind of stuff. I'll uh, talk a little bit more about the storage node setup that we've got. Uh, I think most people are aware of Ceph. Can I just have a quick raise of hands for people that are aware of Ceph? People that may be wanting to use Ceph in future? People that are using Ceph now? <laughs> cool, good stuff. So we're um, using XFS-based OSDs. Now, OSDs are object storage demons. They're essentially the, uh, the service that, that, that runs on a given piece of storage. Now, it could be, in our case, just one single disk. It could be a, set, a RAID set. It could be some other kind of storage. Um, but the, the idea is those in individual object storage demons are uh, on every single um, storage node that we have and uh, on every single um, spinning disk. We only have six disks per host currently. Um, 
So that gives us 12 terabytes of, of, of raw storage per host. Um, but we have enough capacity in there to grow to 24 terabytes if we populate the disks, or if we go to four, four terabyte disks, up to 48 terabytes. So we're weighing in about an eighth of a petabyte currently, which to me sounds quite a lot. Um, but we, we're not even touching the size of that usage so far. And we're not even running any SSDs, which is one of the common things that people generally associate with Ceph. We have not found any issues with it. Um, I I don't know, sometime in the future we're going to look at investing in some SSDs, but due to the sheer number of um, OSDs that we have available, we'd, we would want to make sure that the SSDs wouldn't be hampering the uh, um, actual performance of the, the cluster in any way. So the journals are all on disk. Um, we deployed using Ceph, Ceph Deploy. Um, initially I had some difficulty with it. It wasn't as good as MK CephFS, in my, my opinion, initially. But now it's, um, Alpha's done a lot of work into getting it robust and I rolled out another cluster, task cluster, a couple of days back, and it was very seamless. So I'd recommend you to, to, if you've had any issues with it in the past, give it another go and try it out again. We're using RBD write-back caching, um, which creates a very small sort of 32 meg um, cache on the hypervisor itself to essentially coalesce all the writes that happen. To, so you don't have to wait for the file sync to happen at the other end. Um, that can sound fairly dangerous, but in practice it, it works quite well. We don't have any real heavy users currently, so we may want to re, uh, revisit that at some point in the future to make sure that we, you know, we're, we're safe and uh, stable on that front. And, and as I said, each, each individual uh, storage node has, an OSD, has multiple OSDs on it, and then a small subset of those storage nodes have the monitor service which provides a quorum, um, a, a quorum service for the, the Ceph backend to ensure that there's no sort of split brain situation as you'd normally normally find, and that the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the given state of the, the cluster is actually the given state of what you, want, you, know, what you need to use. Um, on the uh, storage nodes that don't run the monitor service, we run the MDS service, which provides the metadata service for the POSIX file system that we use for the, uh, storage, the system data store in Steph. Now, I mentioned before that we use the snapshot layering driver, um, which is uh, a new thing that's not actually in the the main line of Ceph, but is available uh, on some of the development, uh, the, the Redmine tracker. So you, you, you can download that patch and, and try it out if you want to. And basically what that does is it layers the snapshots. So once you've uploaded it, your image to the uh, um, Ceph data store, you can then create a snapshot, protect the snapshot so that if you come to delete the snapshot in the future, any subsequent uh, child snapshots aren't deleted, and then clone the snapshot. Now, this means that we could upload an image, for example, we do, uh, of 100 gigabytes uh, per of, of an image. And then we can actually clone those in a minimal amount of time. We can write 100, 100 um, virtual machines in a minute if we wanted to. And that's basically down to the, the frequency that we've got the Polar running with an open nebula. We can make it faster, but we're, we're quite happy with that speed so far. <laughs> so um, th that works well. I think we need to work maybe on some better interactions with that within open nebula itself. But I think that might be coming in 4.4, I hope. Um, I'm happy to work with anyone on that. Um, so Ceph's future can hopefully get better. <laughs> I'm sure there's a song about that. Um, some better REST ap admin APIs are coming to infer state of the system so for better monitoring, things like that. There's a, an eight times speed increase in CRC functions and testing that have just hit. Um, OpenZFS has been investigated to, lever to leverage rather than uh, looking at extended attributes or other thi and journals within XFS or ButterFS. Maybe you look at some of the inbuilt ZFS functions, which are obviously very stable and well used. Um, erasure encoding. I don't know if anyone's aware of erasure encoding. It's quite a, a clever concept. It basically reduces your raw storage requirements uh, when you have replicated content. Because one of the, the nice things about Ceph is it, it automatically, or at least it'll let you replicate to an to a, uh, N number. So that could be two, three, four replicas of your data across your Ceph cluster. Um, using the erasure encoding would you know, minimise the amount of space requirements f in raw storage. There's also multi-site replication that's coming on, on soon, uh, enabling to replicate different uh, aspects of your cluster across different sites, which is very handy. Um, there's also a talk of a, an SSD-style caching um, on the hypervisor side, which would mean that similar to, very kind of similar to the way that bcache or flash cache or any other kind of caching mechanism will work, it, it effectively sits on the hypervisor to allow you to write data to it, and then if you do lose your backend, at least you have something available. <laughs> um, okay, so in terms of our deployment, we're generally puppet managed. We have a lot of um, ephemeral and temporal virtual machines that come and go. Um, 
we, we didn't want to keep them within our foreman infrastructure that we currently use um, because we didn't want a lot of uh, cruft to be left about um, by users. So one of the things we want to look at doing is, is uh, making a nodeless fa um, set of puppet manifests that we can allow the users to download, uh, git clone, a uh, little encurses based interface or something similar that then they can choose what kind of role they want the machine to be. We're trying to keep the, um, the system admin aspect of it in terms of people coming to us very minimal. Um, so one of the things we've been using for, for VM images as well to actually generate them is a very nice tool called VWI. It's um, based on, or it's at least it's got some interactions with Vagrant, but it also uses um, libvert as well, which is, in this case, extremely useful. Um, it allows you to create definitions of different virtual machines, and it also comes pre-baked with lots of different operating systems and support for different operating systems, and allows you to um, provision the, 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 the machine image do various things with the machine image and check the machine image is, is valid and, and, and has the various things uh, capable and available to it. Um, so as we wanted to, to curate the machine images, we didn't want to have particular OS images you know, s being stagnant. We wanted to regenerate these machine images every night or you know, within a given time frame so that we keep them up to date. Um, so one of the things we work with uh, over subscription we overcommit the CPU resources on our shared platform by four times because we wanted to ensure that we get the right kind of density for users and the right kind of cost uh, efficiencies as well. Um, we don't have any overcommittal of memory. Um, and obviously, if, if a particular project team wants to manage their own level, then we can just change the template. No, no worries about that. And they can have their own systems if they want to as well. So some future work in Open Nebula. Maybe some hypervisor side caching. I don't, don't know, possibly. I don't know how how much people have used that before. I've tested it out, it seemed to be pretty cool, but yeah, more work needed. Um, better Ceph integration with stuff like attached disks and uh, sort of scaling the Im machine images. I think that just requires a little bit of coordination between how, how where Ceph is currently and obviously bringing up the middleware up to, up to speed. Um, we're gonna put in some SSD-based local storage because you, know, you can't beat local storage in certain instances. Um, we want to uh, leverage more of the Rados gateway for some S3 compliant storage. I've tested that last week. It works really well. Um, more to come on that front. Um, maybe integrate this VM generator into Sunstone. It might be a useful tool for some people to be able to actually generate machine images by themselves and have them you know, uploaded into their own machine store. Uh, that's you know, quite a cool thing, I think. Um, yeah, and over to move over to Vert.io SCSI. Um, one of the final things I want to talk about is hardware pools. Obviously, the organization will work out we have to deal with a lot of video and we have to ingest a lot of video content into the system. And now we use a lot of capture cards for this. And there is no way of getting around the fact that you know, physical devices and virtualization never really has got along too well. But we've been, been, I've been testing some PCI pass-through mechanisms um, to pass through PCI devices of ca capture cards through to the virtual machines outside of OpenNebula, just in KVM and Libvirt itself. And it works. So there's a potential opportunity there to create hardware pools of some form um, because they can also be used for single root IO virtualization for network adapters. Um, now there's a patch that's just come out on a list uh, recently today so for, for the single root IO virtualization uh, network driver. So I'll be testing that out to see if we can maybe coordinate some, some, uh, some research there. Um, and yeah, so once we've got driven the PCI capture device to be bound to the VM, we can drive, um, again, automatically our SDI matrix, our, our video router, essentially, to, to connect to that virtual machine's particular um, capture card and then give it a feed automatically. So a user can go and say, I want BBC One HD, I want the virtual machine, I want it to be bound. We can create the right patching uh, in software and then connect the uh, virtual machine to give them a bit of virtual machine to user. It can go away, develop, test, play. And yeah, there may be some other use cases. And that's it. So thanks. Any questions at all? <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> sure. Well, there's, there's, there's a suite called Phronics uh, Test Suite, which comes with um, various disk. Please um, repeat Sorry, the question. Yeah. Uh, the, the question was, um, any benchmarking mechanisms or techniques for RBD-based uh, 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 block devices? So yeah, we, we used something called Phronics Test Suite, which again includes Bonnie, includes FIO, uh, F FIO, Postmark, lots of other suites to give it a, a random, um, uh, yeah, different diff disk accesses. And what I did is I started to run those in different virtual machines and randomize the actual use pattern so, and ran them over a period of time. So we just 
generated completely random content, completely random disk access to, to just to really soak test the cluster. And it stood up and it worked really well. Um, as, as obviously we've got 36 individual OSDs, when we're coming to do something that requires larger degrees of uh, IOPS, then you know, we have that uh, capability uh, available to us. The actual throughput isn't as fast as it could be, but I think that's maybe down to the way that we've got RBD striping at the moment. So again, we've only been running this for you know, a couple of months. We, we've got a lot more testing to do and a lot more work to, to, to find out. But yeah, I've got benchmarks. Cool. Anyone else? Sure. Um, I've tried, yes, the question was another distributed file system like GlusterFS. Yes, we did test some different f file systems uh, a while ago, and they, they, weren't, they weren't too great. We had some difficulties with them. Um, I, in a previous organization I used to work at, we, we tested this for some time, and this was when Ceph was just a very small little baby and Sheepdog was just starting as well. There was issues with it, let's say, in terms of, I, w I won't name the specific one, but there were, there were some issues. And when we came back to this project and started to look at it again, when, when I was asked to, to lead on it, we looked at Ceph and it just ticked all the boxes. And it was performant and it worked, and it seemed to have lots of scale and lots of uh, interest in it. Uh, yeah, Gluster's got the same thing, but I, we've kind of invested a lot of time in, in, in research into this now, so we're probably going to go down this route. But that's not to say that we, you know, we're going to specifically use this in future and uh, all the time. We're always looking at different ways to do things and always you know, better ways to do things. So maybe, but not quite now. No. So the question was, uh, are the hypervisor nodes OSD nodes as well? No. We completely separate the, the two layers. As I said, we've got hypervisor node and the OSDs are completely separate. Things can go really wrong if you, if you have OSDs and hypervisors on the same system. It's just don't do it. Keep them separate. It's, you, know, you, don't need to, you don't need to. If you can afford to just keep, them, keep the two together, do. You can run OSDs and MONs on the same boxes. You can run OSDs and on MONs and MGSs if you want to. But just keep the, the actual um, presentation of the, the, the block device on a different mach machine. So the question was, do we only run um, Linux as our sort of uh, hi on our hypervisors for capturing things? Yes, currently we do. Um, the VW system comes with various definitions for <coughs> Windows. I'm not, obviously, I'm not telling my users that. Uh, OS X, uh, it's different kind, all the different distros, FreeBSD, etc. So you've al we've already got that that in the bag. If you wanted to roll that out, we could cr generate the images fairly easily and then just start to bring it into our into our system. We've not got the requirements to do that yet, so we've not spent the time in doing it. I guess if someone asks the requirement, then yes, we can. But, but we, we generally use Ubuntu um, because that was a, uh, our Debian. Or, uh, um, in other areas, we use CentOS. So again, it's we, we most of the IP Studio project that we work on is all Ubuntu-based because it was um, we provided L LTS support and it had more recent uh, specific drivers and libraries that we needed um, because it's quite a large ecosystem we need to manage. We wanted to just stick with one particular platform and just get get that running first. So, but there is no we're not we're not uh, we're not you know, specific on one particular uh, distro. We're uh, fairly agnostic in that respect. Okay, anyone else? Yeah, sure. Actually, I have a question that I see that um, also for testing, you got a lot of knowledge, and I see that you are very active in the Linux IOC, helping people and stuff. Sure. I want to thank you for that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you guys. Thank you.